So I want to take a moment and welcome everyone to our Terrestrial uh, Invasive Species Partner Roundtable. Um, we will be hosting an aquatic roundtable on Thursday at the same time. Um, our meeting is scheduled to run to 1130 today, um, but there are a lot of us on the call. Um, so I'm happy to stay on longer, recognizing that some folks may need to get off for other calls. So let's kick things off here and get into our outline. So here we are right now, a little after 10 o'clock, um, giving our welcome and our, our little overview and agenda. Um, in a minute here, I'll kick things off and give a brief update about uh, APIP's work in 2021, now that we've completed our annual report, and also talk a little bit about our plans for 2022. After that, I'll work through a list of some of our partners um, and ask them to just give a brief update, two to three minutes, about what they're working on in 2022, um, and especially if they're looking for um, folks to coordinate with on those activities. Um, once we work through that list of named partners, we'll open the discussion up and have an open forum discussion about ways we can work together in 2022 and what our, our priorities are. Uh, as I mentioned, our meeting is scheduled to wrap up at 1130, so around 1125, I'll kind of bring the conversation back together. i show a couple final slides with some uh, future planned webinars and activities that we want to share with you folks. Um, and after that, like I said, I'm more than happy to stay on and continue talking to folks. So without further ado, um, I'm going to get into our 2021 highlights. Um, and I am remiss in forgetting to uh, introduce my APIP uh, colleagues here. We have Tamara on the line. She's our APIP manager. We also have Brian, and he is my aquatic counterpart who will be hosting our talk on Thursday, and Zach, who is our conservation and GIS analyst. Um, so as I talk through our highlights from 2021, Brian is going to drop a link in the chat where you can find all of our annual reports, uh, not only our, our large APEP annual report, but also the report written by our seasonal stewards. So you can see here um, we have Megan on the left and Azealia on the right, um, and also the reports written by our terrestrial early detection and rapid response crew, who you'll see on the next slide, and also our aquatic early detection and rapid response crew, who I'm sure Brian will touch on on Thursday. So getting into some of our survey work, um, our APIP staff, our partners, our volunteers, as well as our terrestrial early detection and rapid response crew from Invasive Plant Control, were responsible for surveying 38 New York State DEC campgrounds this year, along with over 130, 130 recreational access points. So that includes trailheads and boat launches and the sort. We also sec surveyed sections of over 30 forest preserves and all are part of over 40 road corridors. And these are mostly state DOT road corridors, but we also do do work on county and local roads as well. All told, we performed over 3,100 invasive plant assessments this season. We did find about 460 new terrestrial invasive plant infestations this year, but I do want to note that these aren't new to the PRISM infestations, they're just new to us. So over time, as our large uh, infestations come under control and we spend less time on managing those large historic populations, it allows us to have more time to go out and survey new areas, and that's how we find these, these new populations. Also in 2021, we were able to expand our seasonal capacity. So we had two stewards this season and last season instead of one. And that really allowed us to get out and survey a lot more trailheads and do some work with jumping worms and some more invasive pest surveys. Those, four new, those 460 new populations bring us to about 6,500 map infestations within the prism. So what are we doing about all those infestations that we, we know about? Um, so first we've prioritized them and we have about 3,000 prioritized infestations at this time. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we do have a lovely picture of our great EDRR crew here from Invasive Plant Control this summer. And I believe Richard's on the call and we'll give an update once we get to that section. So we managed about 735 infestations this year and that totals over 41 acres. We're able to document the absence of invasives at about 1,500 historically managed sites. But what's that mean? So of the sites that we've historically been able to manage, about 63% of them no longer have invasive species observed for at least one year. So that means our management is, is working. We're going out and seeing that we've, you know, these invasive numbers are becoming reduced or, you know, over time eradicated. 76% of our priority terrestrial invasive species infestations are either currently under active management or have been successfully managed. Um, and that other 24%, we largely need um, to gather permissions to do that work. Um, 
so I've talked about our, our seasonal staff and our EDRR crew who are responsible for a lot of our work, but we also have a great suite of volunteers who work on an outweed management partnership. And these folks go out and gather permissions to treat uh, knotweed in high priority areas. And through that program, we were able to treat 117 knotweed sites this year. Getting into forest pests, um, this year we were unfortunate that we found uh, two new infestations of emerald ash borer within the blue line. One of these was from a trap that we had set um, in the Bolton Landing area, and the second was um, a landowner report in the Johnsburg area. Additional detections were made in Clinton and Franklin counties outside the blue lines by our partners at the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Um, much like last year, we did join forces with partners in the Lake Jed George watershed to combat the threat of hemlock woolly adelgid. So Zach collaborated with Cooney's Advanced Science Research Center to remotely detect HWA using freely available remote sensing data. We also assisted New York State DEC with their hemlock woolly adelgid survey and treatment efforts. And with a large amount of assistance from the Lake George Land Conservancy and New York State DEC, we completed our second season of treatments on Dome Island. And for those of you who don't know, Dome Island is an island in the middle of Lake George that is owned by the Nature Conservancy, and it could serve as a jumping point between the shores um, of, of Lake George for the, the hemlock woolly adelgid to, to jump. So over the past two seasons, we've been able to treat 928 trees for hemlock woolly adelgid, which represents about 36% of the hemlock trees on that island. And on the right here, we have a picture of Tamara out prepping some trees on the island, flagging them for treatment um, in future days. So what are our plans um, and, and some opportunities for you folks moving forward to 2022? Once again, we're working to contract our professional EDRR crew. Um, we're very, very pleased to announce that we will have three seasonal staff this summer. So um, Adelia Baker, who you saw on our second slide, will be joining us once again at the end of this month, actually, to join us as the Invasive Species Management Assistant. She'll be helping us gather some of those landowner permissions. We'll once again have our campground steward, but we've been able to extend that position from 12 to 15 weeks to get a little bit more work done. And we will also have a forest pest research assistant to help with all the forest pest work that we're doing this year. And that will be, uh, that position will serve under Zach's guidance. Once again, we will um, work with our volunteers for our knotweed management partnership. We will continue our HWA remote sensing survey and control efforts. And you'll see a few things here that are, are in bold. And those are opportunities for you folks to get involved. So next Wednesday, I believe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, the days seem to, to go by fast here. Um, we'll be offering a webinar on our citizen science hunt for HWA, and there will be five follow-up field trips uh, hosted by our partners in conjunction with that for folks to get in the field and get some hands-on experience identifying hemlocks and looking for hemlock really adulted. We'll be once again working on our HWA or EAB, excuse me, survey and monitoring work. We have also proposed a site to USDA APHIS for the release of a biocontrol um, and are awaiting approval for that. Um, we will be hosting our, our normal suite of workshops, outreach events, and more. So stay tuned. And as I mentioned at the end, I'll put up a, a couple slides that show some uh, recently soon to come events for folks to get involved with. Um, and most importantly for today, maybe, um, APIP is working on our strategic plan. So we want to make sure that our, our plan for the next five years is aligned in, with, with the best goals moving forward. And we have a brief survey that we've prepared to get folks input on how we can best direct our work. And Brian will drop a link to that uh, survey in the chat. And I encourage folks after a meeting today to head over there and take that survey. Let's so get into our partner discussion part of our talk today. Um, and I do have a list of some of our partners here on the right that we will work through before we open it up. Um, the main goal of our discussion today is just to talk about our work in 2022 very briefly and look for opportunities for us to coordinate together. Um, there are a lot of us on the call today. I think we're at about 43. So I ask that folks do keep their uh, discussions brief so that we have a chance to get through any everyone. So without further ado, I will pass it to Tom with Egg and Markets to give a brief update. Sorry, just trying to find my uh, my mute button there. And I was trying to double check some of the EAB locations you were talking about to see if they were confirmed. So I was about looking at map, bouncing back, look at old EAB maps. Um, 
pretty much status quo uh, with spotted lanternfly. We did find um, a new single dead adult out in the Finger Lakes region in, um, what county was it? Uh, Monroe County. Um, but it was a, a dead adult. It was associated with some, some fencing material that was transported and it was a dead adult found. Um, so Warren County, it does not have an infestation that we know of. We are surveying in that area. Uh, right now, we're concentrating. We have a two-week blitz survey in the Binghamton area where uh, we're continuing to go along the river uh, west and south of the river. And they found 33 eggs, uh, sorry, 39 eggs between two teams um, just today. Uh, and that's the first day of the two-week blitz. Um, earlier this week, I contacted... Um, well, actually, Tamara contacted me about the uh, SLF traps being available, and we will be able to supply a, a number of SLF traps in the spring for uh, APIP, and we appreciate that. Uh, one of the places we're finding these pop-up locations and introductions is trailheads, recreation, landing sites, parking areas for recreation activities, um, and th those are the sort of areas we would want to target. Um, especially in the Adirondacks, we would not want folks traveling from other areas to bring SLF up into the Adirondacks. Um, there might be some microclimates up there where they can meet, reach sexual maturity, but most of the Adirondacks are um, probably out of their sexual maturity range. So the adults may travel up, um, but they wouldn't reach sexual maturity um, in, in the number of growing degree days that they need. Um, so at least uh, the core of the Adirondacks is pretty much safe from that, but the periphery and some of the outer lying areas outside the blue line, and along, especially along some of the, the lake and river valleys where there are microclimates, those are the areas that we're most concerned with for spotted lantern fly. Um, the box tree moth issue on the western part of the state, um, again, it came in from Canada and, and APIP shares a, a nice lengthy long Canadian border. Um, so if there are any ornamental uh, boxwood plantings, and, and especially at historic sites, libraries, things like that, town halls, uh, often have historic boxwood hedges, cemeteries, those type of locations uh, would be prime target for box tree moth survey. And then also uh, not known to be in New York yet, but introduced into uh, Pennsylvania uh, from Canada is uh, Elm Zigzag Sawfly. In your adjoining prison over there in Slilo, there's a population of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, swamp uh, elm, and I believe there's some in the APIP region as well. Um, so that's a concern as far as you know, th those native elm populations. Again, not found in New York yet, but considering that it's on the Canadian border, um, could easily fly over um, as so many other pests have. So that's really all I have it as far as an update from Ag and Markets. Appreciate your support uh, on the SLF trapping and uh, keep up the great work. So thanks. Thanks, Tom. And I don't think we have anyone from IMAP joining us, but IMAP Invasives does have a citizen science SLF program that you can get involved with. You can sign up for a grid score and go out and survey for that pass. You know what? That was my third thing and my third bullet and I totally forgot. <laughs> and, <laughs> no, no and, worries. And, and Tamara, Tamara asked a question in the chat too. Are we planning any surveys? Yes, uh, we will do be be doing a limited number of surveys. Uh, but more importantly, the areas we won't be able to reach, we're promoting, as you mentioned, the claim a grid program, which is being reset. So any grid, grids that were claimed last year are now, I believe, unset, and they're claimable again. Um, the launch of that will be the beginning of March. And I, I've added, um, I personally went in and added 130 or so uh, additional grids. Our operations manager targeted another 80 something grid. So there should be about 500 claimable grids um, scattered throughout the state. And I did select some in APIP to add to what was there because it was kind of slim pickings uh, in APIP. Um, so, you know, if you could particip participate in that IMAP claim a grid square project you know it's for i'm at it's for slf and it's also for tree of heaven that would you know bolster our survey abilities from our staff side but you know thanks thanks tom i will pass the torch uh to kathy at apa 
Hello, my name is Kathy Regan. I'm the supervisor of the Research and Scientific Services Division at the APA. We deal with the administrative end of invasive species management, not um, the on the boots ground hard work that you guys are all doing. Um, the one thing that we're working on this year, and we um, probably mentioned it last year because uh, we are state glacially slow sometimes, the APA and the DEC are in the process of drafting revisions to a guidance document that we have that directs how um, BMPs can be used to control invasive species on DEC lands within the park. Um, this document was last updated in 2018, and it's a cumbersome procedure to um, amend the guidance document right now to, and makes it difficult when we get new species coming into the park or new tools developed to address these invasive species. So APIP has been helping me immensely in working with DEC to try to streamline this process. And um, once we do it, hopefully we won't need to update this document for at least 10 years so that um, everything else will move smoothly if we do it properly. And that's what we're working on. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I will pass the torch to Alex at DOT, and uh, Chris, you can jump in after Alex. Great, thanks, Becca. Um, so yeah, I am Alex von Bieberstein. I'm a landscape architect with NYSDOT, based out of the main office in Albany. And um, I wanted to um, make sure that we welcomed Andrea Becker. Um, I think that she's planning on being on the call today, but she's our new maintenance environmental coordinator for Region 1. Based out, she's based out of the Albany office, which is Region 1, um, but she's also working in um, Essex, Warren, and, and Saratoga counties um, up in the park. Um, she replaces Scott Capeller, who is now with New York State Thruway. And um, in terms of DOT um, work that's going on, our maintenance crews are continuing to adapt mowing schedules to reduce the spread of invasives, including parsnip and knotweed and purple loosestrife. Um, we're monitoring and managing invasive species along rights of way and also at NISDOT facilities. And, um, we're going to be continuing the boat wash partnership with the Adirondack Watershed Institute, um, continuing our training efforts, internal training with NISDOT staff on invasive species detection and treatment. And also there's been a large push um, for spotted lanternfly trainings um, and information um, getting out to staff, including posters and scraper cards. And DOT is also assisting with um, trapping and monitoring of SLF as part of a multi-agency task, task force. Um, and kind of at the guidance and research statewide level. Um, NISDOT's been preparing guidance documents for seeding and soil management in the Adirondack Park. Um, we're nearing completion on those. The FGEIS, or the Master Travel Corridor Unit Management Plan, the TCUMP, um, was officially signed in 2021 and will be incorporated into the NISDOT um, TEM, which is the Environmental Manual, um, and that is available on our website. If you Google NISDOT TEM, um, it will be sec section 6.3. and there's a requirement for annual reporting as part of the TCOMP, um, and we are working on preparing our annual report. And that's really going to be um, a sort of working document related to documenting and planning, work planning. Um, not a super polished um, report, but it will have a portfolio section where we highlight, you know, projects with lots of graphics and images. And we're continuing to identify pilot areas for alternative mowing schedules um, and consistent. Um, pollinator conservation practices that are consistent with our draft revised vegetation management guidelines. And I can turn it over to Chris if she wants to add um, anything about our state planning and research project. Can you guys hear me? Hello? We can hear you, Chris. I can hear you, Chris. Okay, yep. all right, I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. I'm using a new uh, uh, headphone, so I wasn't sure. So uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Colley. I'm a senior landscape architect here at the New York State Department of Transportation. Um, I work with Alex and Peter in the Landscape Architecture Bureau. Uh, part of what I do for invasive species with the department is manage some research projects, SPR research projects. I'm currently managing two and overseeing another one. Um, so there's a total of three that we're working on uh, that deal with invasive species. 
The first one is um, been ongoing for quite some time, and it is the Phragmites Biocontrol Project. Uh, that's being um, managed by Baron Blossy from Cornell University. Um, this is the second uh, phase of that project, and we're hoping to initiate a third phase um, in the next uh, in this year. Uh, I don't know if it will uh, actually formally begin this year or if it will begin next year, but we're going to at least uh, start the paperwork for uh, that. <clears throat> And, and again, the funding isn't guaranteed, so we, we will have to apply for that funding. Uh, that project was uh, supposed to be finding a biocontrol for Phragmites, and they were looking at a species called Ar Arcanaria gemini puncta. Um, and unfortunately, progress has stalled out with the APHIS permit to release that biocontrol agent in the United States. Um, that particular biocontrol agent has been released in Canada, but we've not been allowed um, from USDA hasn't granted us permission to release it because uh, there are several Gulf states, Louisiana, Mississippi, that see the Phragmites as a beneficial invader. They claim that erosion in the Gulf would be exacerbated by the elimination of Phragmites. And so they're, um, they're concerned about the release of a biocontrol agent. Uh, Baird has been very busy writing papers supporting the release of the biocontrol agent, which he believes will not sur survive in the Southern states and does not pose an imminent threat to the populations down there at the Gulf. Uh, per APHIS instructions, he needs to go and get broad agreement from uh, the southern states that Phragmites is a nuisance plant in other parts of the state, uh, you know, obviously exclusive of its location at the Gulf. Um, and he is currently working on that, and that is being funded by this particular project. As I said, we're looking to extend the project because we're hoping that eventually APHIS will grant a permit to release the biocontrol agent in the United States and we'll be able to continue on with the research um, there. Uh, that project is uh, ending this year and the final report will be due. It's likely that Baird will be given um, a webinar. It's unclear at this time whether or not that webinar will be in-house or whether it will be made available to um, others as well. The uh, next project that we're working on is uh, with uh, Dylan, Dr. Uh, Dylan from uh, ESF, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Dylan Perry from uh, ESF on swallow warp biocontrol. Um, that project is not scheduled to end until 2023. Uh, they've done two seasons of releases. Uh, the first year was spent trying to um, establish rearing protocols for the insects so that they could have populations to release. Uh, they ran into a lot of problems early on, but overcame those problems um, and were able to do successful releases in 2020 and 2021. Um, there are continuing to be some issues with rearing the insects in the greenhouse. Uh, they have noted a, that there appears to be an obligatory diapause after two generations, despite long day exposure. Um, this was consistent for both the 2020 and 2021 rearing seasons. Uh, this has implications for uh, large scale rearing of the insects. It may not be possible to continuously rear um, Hypena opulenta and bank them for subsequent field releases. So they're going to be working that out in 2022. They're going to try to determine if individuals that did not display the obligatory diapause after two generations will produce offspring with the same behavior or if there is an additional environmental component beyond the short day that triggers diapause. So they're going to be working out um, some rearing issues with the Hypena opulenta um, this year. Um, in the 2020 and 2021 um, field seasons, there were two approaches to releasing Hypena. They released both adults and larvae. Um, both um, methods have their positive and negative um, attributes to them. Uh, for the adults, it's good because you know how many adults are in the field. However, it's more labor intensive to release the adults because you have to rear them all the way to the adult stage. Um, they also get good dispersal with the moths. 
Um, with the larvae, they don't know how many adults emerge. Um, and they are easier to rear and transport, but it's hard to see how, um, how well they survived in the field. Um, they are currently only uh, finding a limited amount of overwintering and overpositing uh, data um, because it's really hard to find the larvae in the field. They're pretty elusive and hard to detect. Um, so they don't really know the level of establishment in the field. It's also quite labor intensive to try to find them and there's a poor probability of detection. So um, they did try to trap the Hypena opulenta, but currently there's no pheromone. They used a blend of acetic acid and 3-methyl-1-butanol, um, which has been used to attract the uh, opu uh, Hypena. It's a very sweet smelling, kind of like uh, fermented molasses. Um, they're going to evaluate detection chemicals in 2022. Uh, they're gonna use a number of different methods to do that. They're going to take a virgin female moth and uh, put them in a cage and hope that they will be emitting a pheromone and then any males that are attracted will be trapped on the cage. Um, and then they're going to test some chemical attractants as well. Uh, so um, in winter 21-22, they set up a pilot study uh, to determine the fate of larvae and overwintering pupa. Um, they're attaching the pupa to burlap with beeswax, covering with leaf litter, and then pinning them in place. And they're going to place them in a cage to prevent predation, and then uh, recollect in the spring to determine mortality. So uh, they're trying to figure out what the... Uh, overwintering rate is and the mortality rate of the pupa are. They also are in the process of creating a release and monitoring guide um, for vegetation monitoring and insect establishment with cages that's more suitable for uh, property and project um, property managers and forest managers. So again, that project is ongoing, doesn't until 2023. Um, but I am hoping um, that we'll be able to extend that as well when the time comes. Uh, the final research project that we uh, have not yet started is oh, and the, Chris, um, I'm going to ask if you could just do that real briefly because we do yep. have a lot of other speakers, and yep. I would encourage people to reach out for to you because you have a lot of great detail on these on these research projects. Um, so we'll put your email in the chat, and people can reach out to you if they want some more direct information on that. Thanks a lot, Chris. Sure. So um, the final one has not yet started. It is a eDNA where we are going to attempt to see the viability of using eDNA detection for spotted lanternfly. Um, we're in the contract negotiation phase with uh, the university and we're waiting for contract award and project start. We're hoping that that will begin in spring of 2022. And that is it. Thanks so much, Chris and Alex. I did see that Steve Young is, is on, so I will invite Steve next. I know he's not on my list to give a brief update from Natural, Natural Heritage. Steve, if you're speaking, you're on chat and can't hear you. Looks like Steve may have stepped away. We'll move them down our list. And Caitlin, I don't know if you and J or Jamie want to give a brief update from Hamilton County Soil and Water. Becca, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's been wonderful to hear about all of the great work in 2021, as well as what's on tap for 2022. A brief review of some of the highlights for Hamilton County Soil and Water in 2021. We have technicians, uh, Lenny and Jamie, who are certified pesticide applicators, and they dedicated around 80 hours to terrestrial invasive plant management. We also focused on some Gallerucella beetle monitoring, landowner assistance, and education. And I have to give a shout out to our partners, many of whom are on the call today, DEC and APIP for participating in many of our education events and making them a, a wonderful success. 
um, what's in store for us in 2022. At our February Board of Directors meeting, our board approved the purchase of a Mavic Air 2 drone, which we are super stoked about. And we hope to use this drone for a lot of conservation services, helping our municipalities with mapping, taking before and after shots of our um, sediment erosion control problems, as well as serving for invasive species. I know that APIP purchased a drone um, way back in the day when they were first, when the technology first came out. And so um, we hope to seek some guidance from APIP about how we can effectively use this, maybe augment some of your um, monitoring efforts and, and definitely enhance what we're doing here in Hamilton County. We also hope to rear some more Gallusurella beetles this, um, this spring and summer, releasing them along priority sites. And we will also make sure that invasive species are highlighted dur during our Envirothon and Conservation Field Day events for students. And finally, we are very excited to participate on APIP's Strategic Plan Committee. Um, I'm gonna pop a link to our 2021 annual report, and there you can read more about our invasive species efforts. Becca, thank you. That's all from Soil and Water. Thanks, Caitlin. Steve, are you able to join us now? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yep, thanks, Steve. Okay, great. Okay, hi, I'm Steve Young from the New York Natural Heritage Program and the Adirondack Botanical Society. And I just want to talk about that. The uh, Adirondack Botanical Society and the uh, Adirondack Orchid Survey have kind of slowed down during uh, the pandemic, but we hope to start up again this field season and uh, doing some more floras of the region and and looking for more orchids. And, and in doing that, also looking for invasives along the way. So uh, I'll, if anybody wants to join the Adirondack Orchid Survey, it is an iNaturalist project, so you can do that. And uh, I'll be sending out some information also about the Adirondack Botanical Society. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And with that, I'll pass it to Marin from Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District. Thanks, Baca. Um, so just a few updates, I'll keep it brief. Um, but basically for upcoming for this year, um, we don't have any like educational grants on invasive species. Um, but we're still continuing to provide technical support to people in the county, um, as well as assisting other counties with questions on invasive species management and monitoring. Um, similar to uh, Caitlin over at Hamilton County, we are doing the rearing and releasing of Gallucera beetles. Um, and we actually had the opportunity this last year to assist two of our other neighboring counties. Um, with doing releases uh, in areas that didn't have established beetle populations. Um, so we'll continue to do that. Um, I see Ed is on the call um, from the Scroon Lake Association, um, and he had actually, or East Shore Scroon Lake, um, and he had actually reached out to us for beetles last year. Um, so we'll continue with that. Um, other areas we're interested in are Basically our construction projects, it seems like more and more we're seeing invasive species on the project sites. And in the past, you know, we've reached out to APIP to help out, um, you know, some of those areas are managing knotweed. Um, and so it just, you know, we have to cover uh, managing the invasive species as well as the project install because it might affect um, how the stormwater pond is running uh, or any of those things. So we're gonna continue to do that. Um, one project in particular is actually improving uh, a community garden area. Um, and we're gonna be installing raised beds. Uh, basically there's contaminated soil at the site, but there's gonna be a big wooded area. We have to remove um, a bunch of trees and there's, it is riddled with invasives such as like bittersweet and knotweed. Um, so we're going to be working with our highway departments and probably reaching out to some folks about um, making sure we get that buttoned up. Uh, in addition, um, we do manage a park property uh, 
that basically it's some stormwater retention ponds um, before uh, runoff uh, reaches Lake George. Um, and we continue to manage, do a few like invasive species removal days and monitoring um, for burning bush, loosestrife, oriental bittersweet. Um, I believe there was Phragmites on the site years ago, but that's been removed. Um, and then another thing we're focusing on is just the gypsy moth outreach. I'm sure many of you were affected by that uh, this past year, and this year will be, I'm sure, just as bad and with just as many questions. So we'll be focusing on that. And then there's a lot Bob will have to say for the aquatics discussion on Thursday. Um, as we've been doing uh, some educational videos um, about identifying species underwater uh, and then, you know, all sorts of stuff for the lake. So uh, any questions on the aquatics, definitely uh, reach out to Bob Bombard on Thursday. So thanks. Thanks so much, Maren. I am now going to pass it to Stephanie at Warren County Highway Department. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephanie Tayo. I'm actually with Herkimer County Highway Department. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> instead of Warren, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm Deputy uh, Highway Superintendent, and we work with our Herkimer County Soil and Water and uh, APIP as for roadside um, invasive species management. Um, most of the other two agencies, APIP and the county, the Soil Department, um, they of course are doing a lot of the front of the work. Um, we mostly do coordination on our end. We're coordinating with mowing. So we have our mowing timed with their treatments. Um, it's been, these programs have been, we've been working with both of them for probably two to three years now. And we're starting to see um, quite a decline in, in both um, the knotweed and um, the wild parsnip. So um, as long as we keep, keep hammering at it, um, we're hoping to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> and I uh, really appreciate all the efforts of APIP um, uh, in helping us with our roads in the town of Webb and Old Forge area. Um, it's a quite a quite a um, important area to our county. So it's uh, great to have a great partner to work with. And again, appreciate all the efforts. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. And once again, my apologies for getting your county wrong. Oh, that, that's okay. <laughs> With that, I will pass it off to the Sable River Association. I don't know if, if Carrie or Liz want to give an update for us. Hi, Becca. Thanks. So uh, this is Carrie Persian, um, Biodiversity Research Manager at the Sable River Association in Wilmington. Um, Liz Metzger is also on the call. She was our 2021 River Steward and is staying on as a research associate, and she's really helped to boost our terrestrial invasive species work um, in the watershed over the past year. Uh, with, with the cooperation and help from APIP, we're targeting a couple of large, very large knotweed infestations along the river. There aren't that many along the Osable River, and there's a few that are, seem to be serving as source populations for downstream. So we're, we're slowly picking away at those on the East Branch Osable and this year on the West Branch Osable. Uh, we received a grant to improve our growth medium on new stream banks, uh, and this is in an effort to establish native species, uh, native riparian buffers, and prevent invasive species from moving in. We've developed some custom seed mixes for those riparian areas, and we'll also be conducting additional botanical surveys this, this season to um, customize additional seed mixes to use in hydro seeding and broadcast planting of these spots. We're hosting um, an HWA field training with APIP in the in the coming weeks. And in the Osable watershed, there's no um, hemlock woolly adelgid in the Osable yet, but we seem to be the next watershed on the major tourism travel corridor coming up from Lake George. And we'd like to um, be able to monitor uh, and hopefully find zeros in all of our spaces, but monitor with uh, residents of our watershed. We plan to install two boot brush stations at trailheads in the Osable watershed, and the Nature Conservancy has put these on their private lands, but these will be the, per the first boot brush stations in this area on public lands. So we got approval um, and some excitement built up from DEC to install these boot brush stations and, and hopefully remove seeds from people's boots. Um, 
finally, we're serving as uh, the New York pilot partner for the Lake Champlain Basin Program Streamwise program that they've been developing over the, next, the past few years. And we'll be working with several landowners in a landowner incentive program to improve and maintain riparian buffers, um, hoping for natives, but this will give us the opportunity to work with several landowners and survey for other invasives along the river corridor. Thanks, Becca. Thanks, Carrie. With that, we'll pass it to Derek at the Adirondack Land Trust. Hey, everyone, how are you? Um, so yes, I'm Derek Rogers, the stewardship manager at the Adirondack Land Trust and really mostly here to, to learn and, and, and educate myself on, on all things invasives and thanks for all the great work everyone's doing. Um, but also I wanna to look to identify potential ways in which um, the Adirondack Land Trust can be of assistance to APIPS initiatives. Um, you know, we hold over 16,000 acres in conservation easement lands. It's about 90 different landowner partners we work with and people are always asking about ways in which they can manage certain invasive species. So just really trying to find a, a good way to coordinate with them and point them towards the right resources. But also I see opportunities for potentially, you know, participating in some early detection rapid response while myself and some of the staff are out monitoring our easements. You know, we have several knowledgeable folks on staff that are, I think, generally looking for this stuff, but you know, having sort of more of a targeted focus um, given the breadth of, of the region that we work in. You know, there's so many different um, places in the Adirondacks where we have property. So kind of knowing what to target while we're out would be super helpful. And I certainly see um, myself participating in more of a kind of one-on-one -on -one forum with some of the folks at APEP so we can kind of dial in on this more. Um, but, you know, also looking at educational opportunities. So not only with, with our conservation easement landowners, but also on some ALT preserves. Um, we have a boot brush station at Coon Mountain Preserve with a really nice educational sign that we got from APIP. And I think it's great. You know, we'd look to potentially expand that program. Um, and yeah, I believe that's about it for now that I wanted to mention. So I'm um, looking forward to continuing participation in the future and uh, connecting with you more. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. I'll reach out with an email some more information for you after this call. Thank you. With that, I'll pass it off to our uh, Terrestrial Early Detection and Rapid Response Crew contractor, IPC. Uh, Richard, I don't know if you want to give a brief overview of the work you folks do for us. So I'm Richard. We've, I've been working with the Nature Conservancy for four years now. For the last two, I've been helping lead our project for with the SDDR, our leader. Um, we we're just the guys who go out and we're finding any new invasives along the highway corridors and then we're treating and removing them as needed. Thanks, Richard. We really appreciate working with you guys and all the great work you do. With that, I'll pass it off to Ezra at Adirondack Research. Hi there, Ezra Schwartzberg, Adirondack Research. Nice to see you all. Um, we've had several terrestrial and aquatic projects this year, but I'll go through a couple of the terrestrial. Um, we've continued on with our Hemlock, Woolly Adelgid, and Hemlock modeling project with USDA. So we performed a, a whole bunch of surveys in the Lake George and kind of Southern Adirondack area. Um, we have anticipated funding for 2022 through USDA to continue testing the efficacy and survey efficiency of looking for Hemlock, Woolly Adelgid while improving our, our Hemlock model, um, which other partners are using, and that's freely available. Um, we performed re, uh, native plant reestablishment studies for APIP for Japanese knotweed and uh, Phragmites treatment sites. Um, so we finished that this year. Um, and then we had several aquatic projects um, doing the APIP uh, early detection aquatic surveys, as well as early detection surveys for the Capital Region Prism and the DEC. And we also had a lot of uh, private lake surveys, and we'll cover that with uh, Brian's meeting later in the week. Um, other things, Green Goat Maps, we have decided not to pursue sponsorships from our partners, at least not paid sponsorships, but we are partnering, uh, continuing to partner with people to put um, clean, drain, dry, and uh, hemlock woolly adulted information on those maps. So we have a new map, uh, the Saratoga area map coming out, and we're putting HWA prevention and uh, early detection information on that map. 
Um, and last thing I want to say is we are hiring five to six um, field assistants this summer. So um, please forward people on to our website. We have an employment tab on there that you can find. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ezra. A couple new faces for me. I'll now pass it to Matt and or Kirsten with the New York Assembly if you have any updates you'd like to share. Hey, everybody. Hope everyone's having a good day. Uh, my name is Matt McDonald. I'm a chief of staff for Assemblyman Simpson. He's actually in an, uh, another meeting at the moment, uh, but uh, he wanted to just let everyone know. So what we're doing right now, um, as you all know, uh, it is uh, the mad dash to the budget uh, for the state assembly, for the state legislature. And so what we're doing is we're just trying to build some uh, some consensus support for, for funding in the budget uh, relative to uh, combating invasives. Uh, the executive budget proposal did include some uh, some funding uh, for eradication, uh, specifically uh, more broadly. And then uh, they got she was a little bit more pinpointing towards uh, invasive species uh, for the Adirondacks, uh, um, uh, Lake George, pardon me. Um, and uh, that is inclusive uh, to our understanding uh, for aquatics and uh, terrestrial. Um, you know, specifically uh, uh, another appeal that I'll be making later this afternoon is for the uh, for the uh, Hemlock Woolly uh, Adelgid, and um, that is, uh, as everybody knows, that's that's a pretty substantial uh, deal. Uh, that we need to really nip it in the bud, so to speak. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, was it uh, Carrie from uh, the Osable River? Uh, she mentioned that, uh, you know, when I try to get ahead of that with some proactive uh, um, yeah. actions there. So, so at any rate, that's what we're doing uh, on our end. Um, and so if there is something that is relative to state funding um, that you feel would be uh, beneficial to whatever project you guys are working on, please feel free to reach out to us. And so we can incorporate that in, uh, in, in what we're trying to get for uh, the One House Assembly budget proposal. Uh, so it's very important. Uh, so send, send me an email and I can uh, place a, I can give you a follow-up call and uh, get a few notes from you, uh, learn a little bit more and uh, make sure that uh, that is that going through the uh, halls here. Thank you. Yeah, he's in another meeting currently, but I will let you know. Thank you so much, Matt. We're happy to have Absolutely. you on our call today. I'm not sure Jackie with the Adirondack Council is on, but I want to open it up in case she is one of our call-in numbers. We will then move to the East Shore Scroon Lake uh, organization with Bev. Yeah, good morning. Calling in from not-so-sunny Florida. <laughs> uh, just a few things going on over here. Um, we have, we received some uh, beetles from Warren County soil and water that Marin mentioned earlier, and we released them last summer. We don't have a lot of purple loosestrife, but we do have some. Uh, we have uh, members, uh, volunteers from our association that started cutting wild parsnip last summer before it went to seed. So we're going to monitor that for a year or two, and we think we've identified all the locations. Uh, we have a program on Japanese barberry um, that we've identified, and what we found is it responds very well to being sprayed with high concentrations of uh, vinegar, like 20 or 30 percent vinegar mixed with a little salt and water. And sometimes the one treatment's enough, sometimes it needs two, but it does the job. We also tried that on some. Um, uh, other plants that we don't have the results of, one of which is knotweed. Um, it kills the leaves on the knotweed, but they keep shooting back up the following year. So uh, we're gonna need some help there. Um, this summer, we're gonna start a program on garlic mustard. We've identified some locations along roadsides. So that will be something we're gonna work on. Uh, the other thing, um, we did have a lot of gypsy moss uh, spot areas around the lake. Uh, I made the mistake of buying some pheromones and quickly figured out that didn't work very well. Um, but what I did see on YouTube was a video of some guy who was going around with a blowtorch and frying all the little egg cases. So I did about, uh, well, maybe a couple of acres on my own property with a blowtorch. We're going to see what happens this, uh, this summer, if they come back or not. 
uh, it gave me great satisfaction. It's like uh, Rice Krispies when you fry these things, they go snap, crackle, and pop. Um, the other thing is HWA. Um, good news is we don't have any that we know of around Scroon Lake, uh, but we have a very aggressive program to educate our eight or 900 members what to look for and so forth. The one challenge we have is when the optimum times to look for HWA, at least 80% of our membership is in warmer climates. So um, that's all I have for East Shore School Lake Association. Okay, quiet. Thanks so much, Ev. Uh, with that, I will pass it to Donna at the Adirondack Garden Club. Hi, good morning, Becca. Nice to see you. I would like, as a member of the Garden Club, I would like to learn what we can do to coordinate an effort with APIP, how we can track invasive species, and to learn to be better stewards of our land. I would like to hook up with, I would like our group to hook up with IMAP Invasives. And Tamara, I did put your website down <laughs> to contact you. But so I am here representing the Adirondack Garden Club and a learning curve to see what we can do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Donna. I'll be sure to get you in touch with the folks over at IMAP. Thank you. Uh, next, next on our list is Doug with the Not Be Management Partnership. The floor is yours, Doug. Yep. Hi, hi, I'm Doug Johnson. Good to see you, Becca, and everyone else. Uh, so we've continued our efforts last year. We have many volunteers throughout the Adirondacks who help identify sites, obtain permissions from property owners, and then through APIP, uh, we hired uh, Ryan Burkham, who does the actual treatments with the glyphosate. Uh, you know, many sites have no more knotweed that had you know just thousands of plants in the past uh, so this really continues our efforts which we started back in 2008 and I think it made a huge difference I'm so glad that APIP can help continue the efforts. Thanks so much Doug uh, and last but not least I don't know if Bruce or Mike are on from uh, ESF's better on deck properties. Becca, this is Bruce Breimer. I'm the Adirondack Forest Property Manager for SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, we're working on the college properties primarily. We have about 21,000 acres in the Adirondacks that we manage for teaching, research, and demonstration. And most of our problems at the moment are small on the Adirondack properties. We're dealing with some small patches of knotweed, uh, some barberry, that sort of thing. Uh, we're very concerned on hemlock willow adelgid, our property down in Warrensburg, pack demonstration forest is high percentage of hemlock. So that one concerns us in that area. We have not found uh, emerald ash borer as of yet, but uh, we're, we're always in, on the lookout on all our college properties that go from Warrensburg, Newcomb, Wanakeen, and Cranberry Lake uh, for any sort of invasives. And we're more than happy to work with various partners to provide sites for you know, education programs and that sort of thing, if we can help out. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bruce. Look at that, folks, we're on time today. That rarely happens. Uh, so for the next half an hour, we will open it up. I know there are a lot of new faces and names for me and um, I'll just let folks uh, who I have not called on in association with uh, organizations that we work with regularly on the terrestrial side to jump in um, and ask questions, share what they're working on and, and all of that. Uh, Becca, this is Graham Cox. Can I jump in? Of course. Uh, I, uh, and I'm on an advisory committee of the Lake George Land, uh, Land Conservancy, but also uh, part of a thing called Pioneer Village Association in Bolton Landing, where we discovered uh, a new one for you, Japanese stilt grass. And Becca was so quick in, in her response to that. I'm just hoping you come back this coming June or this coming spring and deal the death blow to this down stuff. Thank you. A big thanks to Graham. Graham was our reporter of our first known infestation, as he mentioned, of Japanese stilt grass uh, in our prism. And thanks to his efforts and the efforts of the folks at the HOA, we were able to get out there and treat that. And we will follow up with you folks next year. 
I just want to do a quick follow up on that too. I know that um, it was mentioned that it would be great to train some garden club members in IMAP invasives. And if there's interest in that, we can help coordinate something like that. But really, um, Graham's keen eye and being able to identify that spilt grass, get a hold of us, allow for the for the uh, association to allow us to treat on that property. That is, you know, it, it, it is it's a sad story that Japanese spilt grass is here, but it is the best outcome that we can think of. We spotted it early. We were able to get out there. Uh, the more eyes on the ground, the better. So, um, you know, I think I also heard a little bit today about some partners at Adirondack Land Trust and others who might want a little training for some professional staff in terms of what are the key species we'd like you to look out for uh, when you're out and about that might also apply to some of Bruce's field staff on ESF properties. You know, I think we might be able to pull something together with a handful of our top, top species to look for and then to either get uh, you know, contact us or put them right into IMAP and bases if you find them. So we'll be, Becca and I will be coordinating and thinking some about that. But if you have um, staff that you think you would like to have, you know, just a quick training on a handful of species, just let us know, or you can respond to me in the chat. And building off what Tamara mentioned, I think Graham's example is a great example of how this partnership works. You know, Graham's a member of the public. He found that species and reported it to us. A species I had never seen. It's new to our prism, but one of our seasonal staff members came from an area of the state where it was pretty common. So she came out with us and was able to identify it. Uh, within a week, Richard, who you heard from, and his crew were able to go out there and, and treat it. And um, at the same time I went out to, to look for it, we met with partners from Lake George Land Conservancy since it's in their region so that they could be trained to identify that species too on their properties. Becca, I have just one more question. What are your alternatives to glyphosate? Because that's going off the shelves. Uh, at least the big, the big store in 2023. I had not heard about that in 2023. I know the state has um, enacted some legislation around the use of glyphosate on state lands uh, that took effect uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, but there are exceptions for invasive species work. Yeah, Monsanto said that they would no longer provide it through Home Depot, Lowe's, all those places. Farmers can still use it, but homeowners can't. Interesting. I had not heard that. I'll, I'll have to dig into that some ground. Thank I'll send, you. I'll send you more on that. So I know I saw a lot of names from folks that were uh, associated with Brian's Lake Protector Program. And I know a lot of you folks are associated with uh, individual lake associations. Are there any terrestrial species, you know, that you folks are targeting or that you'd like more information on? Hi, I'm Emily Tyner from Lake Clear Association. Uh, is it okay if I speak? Oh, of course, that's what we're here for. Okay, great. So um, we do have um, a couple of infestations of Japanese knotweed. So I do want to contact, should it be you to work on those? They're on private lands, but I could want you to get landowner permissions. So I'll just contact you, Becca. Yep, reach out to me and we can speak about this. Okay. And then the other things we're working on are, um, we have a road that crosses a tributary to Lake Clear and it has mugwort and I've just been hand pulling that. The other thing I'm noticing on lake shores is colt's foot, and I'm not wondering if anyone else is noticing that or concerned about that. Anyone notice it? I've noticed a number of patches um, on that Girl Scout road that I'm concerned about it getting there, and I'm also interested on um, Little Clear. Um, so I guess it's not. Uh, on a big radar. I'm just noticing that it's spreading along the lake shore. Um, and that we're just dealing with roadside um, terrestrials, um, purple loosestrife and wild parsnip and just hand pulling that. So that's it for me. Thanks, Emily. And we have had, I believe last year on our call, one or two individuals did bring up that they had been seeing some spread of colt's foot. And it's not a species that uh, we at APIP manage. Um, it's um, pretty ubiquitous and it's 
usually found in pretty disturbed areas, so it's not invading natural areas, but other folks have noted that trend that you're seeing. Oh, um, I did find some on Rock Pond, uh, which is, um, a, so it's all along um, Floodwood Road and found it in Rock Pond, which is um, near the St. Regis Canoe area. So I just became a little concerned and it seemed to be spreading because it was just in the moist sand. So apparently whenever there's ice or something, something's spreading it from one spot to another. So something to just be aware of. I know and it's pretty low on the invasive list, but. Uh, that's great information though, Emily. We appreciate that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Becca, I'm Elizabeth Lee. Hold on, um, I'm just, uh, there I am, hi. Um, I'm just joining from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Thank you to everybody else, so many amazing partners on this, um, on this call. I work, I'm the Director of Education at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, and we are just trying to um, keep up with what's happening with terrestrials, and also we'll try and join on later in the week to talk about um, aquatic invasives. And um, really, I, I have the top 10 of the worst on my own personal property in Westport, and so I talk to my neighbors and others about um, terrestrial invasives a lot. And so it's great to just have the, not, the information of who to go to to ask for specific questions. And in particular, um, the question that I'm asked most often is if I'm not allowed to use a pesticide, who is and how can I get them to do it? So that's something that I think landowners would, in my, in my area, in Westport, I live in Westport on Lake Champlain. And um, that's the question that I'm asked the most, how to access a person who is allowed to treat um, invasive species chemically. Yeah, so if folks reach out to us, what we generally do is we'll give them a little bit of background about how they can manage it on their own. And we also do provide a list of uh, herbicide applicators in our region. Um, we are not specifically endorsing anyone on that list. It's just a list of folks that we do know about. Um, and if you folks hear about someone who's not on that list, please you know, send their information that way because we like to keep that list up to date to provide it to folks like you're talking about. I would definitely be interested in seeing that or if you can put it through a link in the chat. Um, and uh, thanks for all this great work. Awesome, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, I'll have folks look around and see if we can find a link to that. And I'm probably the best person to find that, but I'm chatting with you right now. So I will send that to you later if, if we can't get that in the, in the link right now. Is there anyone else from any of the lake associations or any other organizations who have any questions or things they'd like to share? Yes, uh, if I may, can you hear me? Yep, of course, Mark. Martin, sorry. Yeah, so this is uh, Marty Korn. For, I'm on the board of directors of the Spruin Lake Association. And uh, we have in the past been more involved than we are currently with terrestrial invasives. We've of course been spearheading and very active uh, in uh, control of aquatic invasives. And we've been quite successful in, in uh, doing that in Scroon Lake. And I want to um, recognize and uh, thank our uh, partners at ESLA, the East Shore Scroon Lake Association for their work in taking up the terrestrial invasive uh, problem, uh, which of course is more than the purple loose strife. Uh, we have most of the above somewhere in the watershed, the vast 400, roughly 400 square mile watershed of Scroon Lake. So it's a big job. And I think uh, SLA, Scroon Lake Association, will be getting more involved, but hopefully we'll be doing it in partnership with ESLA as we uh, continue our move toward increasing cooperation of the two lake associations. So thank you for this. It's a, a, an excellent webinar. Thank you so much, Marty. We all, need, we all need the information and the support. It's vast and uh, uh, puzzling for many. That's one of the things I love about this partner meeting um, in this roundtable format is everyone, you know, 
kind of gets a chance to hear the latest and greatest of what everyone's working on and it's great for sharing information. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Becca, I was going to chime in both to Eb's point and also Scroon Lake, both both Scroon Lake and all of the lake associations. I know uh, I spend a lot of my time on Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, and I know that many of your members are not around during the prime Hemlock Woolly Adelgid uh, hunting season, if you will, that is coming up right now. But there is another great time to survey for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid from your boat. So in the late spring, very, oh, I'd have to look, you know, maybe we were out in June last year or late May, uh, when the hemlocks are just beginning to bud out, you can just see their, their tips are bright, bright green on the healthy trees. And so you can survey the lake shores from your boat to be looking for bright green tips. And if you see something that is not looking bright green, it's pretty obvious if you're out, you know, during that right time. And you can, you know, I do it in a in a canoe so I can get closer to the shore. And then you can use a bright headlight or a very, very bright flashlight and look up into the trees and see if you can see any of last season's wool on those trees. Sometimes you paddle up and you realize, oh, it's got something called hemlock elongate scale, or sometimes you paddle up and you realize a beaver has eaten the tree and that's why it hasn't, it hasn't leafed out. Um, but if any of the lake associations or any of you um, doesn't have to be on a lake are interested in getting out and paddling or doing some very early season boating, we can send you some information about water-based hemlock woolly adelgid surveys. A great point, Tamara. Thank you so much. And Zach's already on it. He's got the link for the boat surveys right there. <laughs> Perfect. And if you are Thanks, interested Nick. in doing some, let us know because we can we can help make that connection. And it's great to know which lakes you're going to be doing because we always coordinate on who's going to be doing what lakes this year. Tamara, uh, I did receive a message that folks are having problems copying and pasting from chat. Um, can, can someone verify that that's not working for folks? Mine is working just fine, just clicking on the links, so. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Tamara, I, I will definitely be reaching out to you because that would be a great presentation to do the boat surveys um, for our water quality strategy committee meetings. Um, it's usually when all of our lake associations come together and we just talk about updates um, and what you know we should be looking for. Uh, and so, yeah, you'll be hearing from me. <laughs> okay, great. If you can do that before, you know, before mid-June too, then you'll get a chance to get folks out there. Once yeah, those, definitely. Once, yeah, once those needles begin to, you know, kind of, they, they've kind of meet, reach their maturity, uh, you're not going to see that bright, bright green tips. It's really in the spring when they're just budding out and looking, yeah. well, hopefully looking beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, and I think our meeting, we do it quarterly, so it would be good timing with everything. So Perfect. Happy to Awesome. Help. Thanks. Anyone else? I was going to say to the copying and pasting, I am, um, I'm old school when it comes to some of those links, and I can never remember everything that happened So if, during a meeting. So I usually just... Uh, highlight the whole thing with the notes and hit um, copy on my mouse or control C on my keyboard. And then I keep a Word document open and I hit paste or control V. And then I've got all those links after the meeting when I want them. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for that, too, Tamara. I would not have thought of that. Anyone else with any updates? I can't. Uh, I can't copy uh, my iOS system. I can't copy and paste. It's All right. Working. Well, maybe what we'll do is we're we're recording this meeting and we're going to send up the recording of this meeting. Um, at the end of the meeting, I will copy and paste the the chat. And what I can do is send out all those links along with the chat if that works for That's folks. So will everybody Good. who signed in, uh, like myself, will we get a 
a copy on our uh, emails? Yep. So as long as you registered for this event, you got the email yesterday that I sent out, you'll be getting this. I'll send awesome. that email to that same yep. suite of folks. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our last call uh, for, for anyone else to jump in with any updates for us. Well, without further ado then, we will, uh, I just wanna share our last couple slides with our upcoming APIP events. So as you've heard us talking about today, we will be giving our winter 2020 uh, webinar training for serving for Hemlock with Adelgid. Uh, next Wednesday, February 16th from 10 to 11.30 uh, a.m. And you can register for that event on our website. In addition to that online training, we will be doing five in-person field trip trainings so folks can get hands-on uh, training identifying hemlock trees and looking for hemlock woolly adelgid. And you can see the um, the folks hosting those, those field trips as well as their dates and um, you can register for those on our website as well. Um, we are offering, you know, our, tour, our aquatic roundtable, uh, pretty much the partner event to this on Thursday. So I encourage folks with an interest in aquatics to attend that event. And we will be hosting our tradi more traditional partner meeting on uh, April 28th and registration for that is open on our website as well. Um, you can, as I mentioned, you can RSVP for all of these events at our website at www.adkinvasive.com slash events. And with that, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today and sharing this great information. It's great to hear what everyone's working on and look for ways to work together. And I want to give a big shout out to my colleagues for managing the chat and throwing all those links in there. We will get those to you folks after the event. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>